There is a severe thunderstorm warning in effect for Del Rio until 10 p.m. tonight. Potential for 70 mile per hour wind gusts and quarter size hail. The storm will not impact San Antonio, but soon meteorologist Sarah Spivey will be here to have a look at your upcoming forecast. For now, thanks for joining us for KSAT News at 9, streaming right here in the KSAT 12 newsroom. I'm Courtney Friedman. Let's jump right into the latest numbers for Bear County. During tonight's daily briefing, Mayor Ron Nuremberg announced there are now 1,275 positive cases of COVID-19. That's 21 more than yesterday. No additional deaths to report today. The county's toll stands at 44. And we're happy to report 42% of patients have now recovered. And turning to some of our surrounding counties, we have several slight upticks to report. Hayes County now has 155 cases. Guadalupe has 73. Comal County with 49 cases. Wilson County is at 30. And Atascosa County is at 15. We're also tracking these cases online at ksat.com. The governor today laid out his plan to reopen the state and kickstart the economy. But county and city officials here at home aren't exactly on the same page. Tiffany Huertas has a look at the changes and how local leaders are responding. There's just things piling up, you know, um, mortgage, car, bills. Hairstylist Lisa White is devastated after finding out she can't go back to work this week. The coronavirus pandemic has flipped her life upside down. I applied for everything that was forwarded to me that I would be eligible for and have had no response. There are some businesses that I want to open that Texans want open, that the doctors advised were simply not safe enough to open at this particular time. They include barber shops and hair salons, bars and gyms. We are working with our medical team as well as working uh, with members of the industry sectors to open these businesses as soon as possible. Today, Governor Greg Abbott said retail stores, restaurants, movie theaters, and malls in Texas would be allowed to open but they must maintain only 25% occupancy and follow social distancing. Also, the governor made it clear masks are encouraged, but not mandated. We make clear uh, that no jurisdiction can impose any type of penalty or fine for not wearing a mask. Everyone should be encouraged, uh, but by my executive order, it supersedes local orders with regard to any type of fine or penalty for anyone not wearing a mask. County Judge Nelson Wolf does not agree. I think that the uh, worst uh, decision he made uh, was to not require mandatory use of face mask. We cannot impose a fine or a, uh, or a prison term or a jail term on that, but if we put in mandatory do it and we, we, we would have to go to our employers and make sure that they follow through on that. An employer has every right in the world uh, to say you can't come into my place of business if you're not wearing a mask. Tomorrow, city and county officials will meet to discuss a new stay at home work safe order. All I'm asking is to be able to go back to work. For the nine, Tiffany Huertas. We know that's a lot of information. You can read more about the governor's reopening plans for the state right now at KSAT.com. A heads up now for those who regularly use city buses. Beginning today, VIA is operating on its essential service schedule. It's basically modified VIA's schedules to accommodate routes that are used more frequently. VIA says it's an effort to help keep people traveling to and from work to get groceries or help care for others. You can find a full list of which routes are impacted right now on KSAT.com. Local scientists taking matters into their own hands to protect the hands of workers in their medical system. Two labs at UT Health San Antonio are now dedicated solely to making hand sanitizer for UT healthcare providers. The sanitizer meets all World Health Organization guidelines using high purity alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, glycerol and water. The sanitizer specifically is for frontline workers being distributed to UT health offices across the San Antonio area. COVID-19 hitting hard for families that care for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. The daytime rehabilitation centers they're used to going to are currently closed. The night team's Patty Santos tells us how families are now preparing for the reopening of the state. Hi, Matthew. How are you? Fine. Are you bored at home? Uh, a little bit. Matthew's mom, Margaret Constantina, tells us her son is missing the socialization he's been used to for 25 years at the Ark of San Antonio. Many of our family members who depend on the Ark do not have access to child care outside the home. Uh, my son's 38. He still needs to have daycare. 
uh, that isn't available anywhere else. Matt has cerebral palsy, intellectual and developmental disabilities, seizures, and he can't walk. Have a good day. He hasn't been to therapy for nearly two months. Uh, massage is real important for him because he doesn't have very good circulation. What are you doing, Matt? Playing video games. Okay. Luckily, the Constantino family has been able to work from home and care for their son. The pandemic has put a strain on families with unique needs like theirs. Many, many people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are isolated. They're isolated because of their needs, because of a lack of transportation or ability to do some of the things that you and I don't give a second thought to. Mike Bennett, president of the ARC, says they're using Zoom and giving families ideas through their website to fight isolation. They shared these photos showing how participants are staying busy. The good news is Bennett says he'll be studying the governor's announcement to figure out a plan for when and how they can reopen safely. But because each individual has their own unique medical or behavioral needs, that may come with challenges. We have folks who, when they come back, they're going to be a little more capable of adjusting to a mask and to distancing. We have a lot of folks who are not. They're not going to understand why they can't hug their friends or why they have to wear a mask. So we're going to have some challenges. For the Nine, Patty Santos. Let's turn now to the nine at nine. Another Navy warship suffers a COVID-19 outbreak. A Supreme Court ruling leads to a major victory for gun control advocates and Galveston beaches are back open for business a bit early. Here's tonight's nine at nine. Four bodies were found inside an apartment off Henderson Pass near 281. San Antonio police are calling this a triple murder suicide. They believe a 38 year old woman who had recently lost custody of her children fatally shot her three-year-old son, five-year-old daughter, and 68-year-old mother before turning the gun on herself. Police say the bodies were found by the children's father, who had been looking for them. Another U.S. Navy warship has been hit by an outbreak of COVID-19 while at sea. There are now nearly 50 cases aboard the USS Kidd, among the crew of 330. The first case, a sailor was taken off the destroyer by medevac when he showed symptoms. The kid will be returning back to port in San Diego in the coming days for a cleaning. The Navy says a total of 26 ships have reported COVID-19 cases. The Supreme Court has sidestepped issuing a major ruling on a New York handgun law. The case concerns a New York City law that regulates where licensed handgun owners can carry a locked and unloaded handgun. Monday's order marks a victory for supporters of gun regulations who feared the justices would use the law as a way to expand upon a landmark opinion by the late Justice Antonin Scalia. That opinion held for the first time that an individual had a right to keep in their arms at home for self-defense. We really got tired of um, being home and we thought since um, the beach is opening up, it would be a great chance to come out and just get out of the house and get some fresh air. Beachgoers in Galveston don't have to wait to hit the beach again. The shoreline is now open for limited hours between 6 and 9 a.m. Visitors must also stay on the move by walking, running, swimming, or surfing. No blankets or umbrellas are allowed. In St. Louis, there's a growing problem of reckless driving on empty city streets. Police there broke up a crowd of more than 200 people watching illegal stunt driving on Sunday. In addition to the reckless driving, the large groups were in direct violation of the social distancing and stay at home orders, banning gatherings of more than 10 people. One person was arrested. And the French government is investigating an incident of alleged police racism that is causing outrage across the country. A video posted on social media shows Paris police arresting a man while using racist language. The man is heard screaming in the video. Last week, several clashes with police took place around Paris. So far, police are telling CNN they're not commenting. Volkswagen, the world's largest car maker by sales, is back at work. The automaker resumed operations at its biggest factory in Wolfsburg, Germany. It had suspended production in Europe in mid-March. Volkswagen says 8,000 employees started building cars again under extra hygiene measures to curb the spread of COVID-19. Production will also resume this week in Portugal, Spain, Russia, South Africa, and South America. Airbnb implementing new cleaning standards due to coronavirus. Starting in May, property owners must allow a minimum of 24 hours between rentals. Airbnb says that will reduce the chance that a guest might encounter any airborne viruses. The home sharing service is also launching a new guidance 
on how to clean every room in a home and is asking hosts to use specific cleaning products. The Pentagon has officially released three short videos showing unidentified aerial phenomena. The videos show what appears to be unidentified flying objects rapidly moving while recorded by infrared cameras. Two of the videos contain service members reacting in awe at how quickly the objects are moving. Pentagon officials say they released the videos to, quote, clear up any misconceptions by the public on whether or not previously released footage circulating was real or whether or not there is more to the videos, end quote. To read more about these stories, head to ksat.com. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed your Monday. I'm meteorologist Sarah Spivey with a quick check of the weather, and I thought, hey, let's start off with some good news. So I want to show you the oak count today. The oak count in the pollen count is actually really low. It's only at 10, and we're definitely heading down that curve. Oak should completely disappear from the atmosphere uh, by the middle of May, but again, we're, we're pretty much at the end of oak season, so that is good news there. And even in the pollen count, honestly, mold is low as well, so very nice. Now, I'm showing you a picture of outside, and you can see that the clouds have moved in. It was a pretty sunny day, but the clouds are back and we're gonna continue to see the cloud cover overnight and humidity increase. But today the high was 90 degrees, a little bit warmer than seasonally average and will continue to be warmer than seasonally average for the entire week ahead. Another thing I wanna show you on our weather setup is that there are some storms that have developed west of San Antonio uh, along the mountains of Mexico and pushed down toward Del Rio. And so a few rumbles of thunder could be heard well west of San Antonio but if these storms hang on, they may make it to San Antonio by about midnight, but the chance is low, only about 20% to see an isolated shower or storm overnight. Other than that, we're just gonna start off the day tomorrow with areas of fog. Here's a look at current humidity. It really wasn't all that humid today, but humidity is rising. Dew points right now are in the 60s, which again is muggy, but not that bad. But watch what happens to dew points as we head into the early morning hours tomorrow. They'll rise into the 70s, that's icky. That's sticky, that's gross outside, and will allow for fog to develop. So you'll definitely notice the humidity tomorrow. That'll also factor into a bit of a, bit of a heat index tomorrow. Our high temperature for your Tuesday is gonna be right around 90 degrees, but there will be a bit of a heat index. We'll start off the day tomorrow with areas of fog, stubborn cloud cover, and again, a high near 90 degrees. A chance for an isolated shower storm is there, but it'll mainly be a dry day with southeast winds at five to 15 miles per hour. Hour. Then, looking ahead to the week, pretty nice patio weather. In the afternoons, it should be nice and warm. Again, only humid tomorrow. It shouldn't be that humid uh, after about Wednesday morning. We'll be looking at temperatures climbing to the low 90s, but still with low humidity, it should feel great by the end of the week. And then as far as rain chances go, really the only chance is gonna be tomorrow for an isolated shower or storm, and then early Wednesday morning for an isolated shower or storm as we get that dry front moving in and allowing for pleasant weather by the end of the week. Have a great evening. Thanks, Sarah. Earlier this year, Netflix announced a big change to help improve viewers' overall experience. They added a way to stop those autoplay videos and trailers when you're browsing the home screen. RJ Marquez tells us how to turn that function off and brings us some other fun Netflix tips and tricks that might come in handy during quarantine. It's this week's Adulting Hacks. Netflix is finally allowing users to browse in peace without those annoying autoplay videos. Here's how it works. The important thing to know is that this can only be done with a web browser. As of now, there's no way to do it from the Netflix app, your smartphone, tablet, or TV. Once you log in, click on your profile photo and choose Manage Profiles. Under the options for your profile name, language, and parental controls, you'll see a section for autoplay controls. There you can uncheck the autoplay previews box. You can also do this to stop autoplaying series episodes all on your devices and TVs. How about a few more Netflix hacks? The service lets you remove titles from your viewing history. Go to netflix.com forward slash WI viewing activity and you will see your history in chronological order. On the right hand side, you can hide things that you watched. Next tip, Netflix lets you download movies and shows you can watch when you're offline. All you have to do is download the app and look for the downward pointing arrow. Now you can have a few movies ready to go for a long flight or road trip. And the last hack, you can play Netflix Roulette if you don't know what to watch. 
You can filter by genre, IMDb ratings, and Rotten Tomato score to help your searches. Search Netflix Roulette online and plug in the information you want. For example, I search action and adventure, then an IMDb score greater than 9 with a Rotten Tomato score of 90% and got back The Dark Knight. This also works with shows and series. For The Nine, R.G. Marcus. Stay with us, we'll be back in just one minute. It's the part of the show that we call coronavirus Q&A, and we actually ask your questions to some of the experts out there to see what they think about what is happening during this whole COVID-19 crisis. We are joined by Dr. Mike Villarreal from the UTSA Urban Education Institute. Of course, he's a former Texas representative, ran for mayor of San Antonio, but now the Urban Education Institute is studying students and how they learn. Am I explaining that right, Mike? Yes, you are. You are. How, how they're experiencing distance learning during this time of COVID. Explain what you hope to, to find out in this whole thing. We, we want to understand how students um, are experiencing the distance learning uh, requirement. Uh, we have a, a big urban community, a very diverse set of public school students and, and the families they come from uh, are all uh, in different neighborhoods and have different socioeconomic circumstances. And we want to help our school districts uh, plan for the next semester. And so we're, we're trying to collect data to understand how students have learned during this period. And, and, and we also want to find answers to questions like, you know, what is distance learning good for? What is it not good for? Uh, because we suspect that distance learning is going to continue with us to some degree and and there may be another crisis in our our near future that we need to be prepared for uh, but but this technology of connecting to the classroom connecting to teachers connecting the lessons um, is is a, a a real innovation um, there's a whole lot of experimentation taking place and we want to make sure that our education leaders take advantage of it and learn from it how concerned are you uh, that you know there's no playbook on this pandemic and how it should be handled when it comes to our students and when it comes to our kids? How concerned are you that some kids are going to fall behind in this process? I, 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 I am very concerned that we're going to see a, a greater widening of the achievement gap in education uh, between the, the haves and the have-nots. Uh, school is I believe we're going to look back and discover a very important equalizer. It's, it's a place where all kids can go and find caring adults, can connect to their peers, can have focused structured time to read, to study, to learn, to communicate. And, and in this new scenario that we're all living through, um, that is taken away. For some students, it's not a big deal at their homes, they have the 
technology. They have a, a, a their own desk. They have the workspace. They don't have to share a computer. They don't have to get a job to help the family. They're going to continue to progress, maybe not as much as they were previously. But for the children who maybe are now finding themselves as the main uh, breadwinners because mom and dad have been laid off or um, are not considered critical workers. The fast food industry is employing a lot of our teenagers and, may, and a lot of them are not keeping up with their studies. Um, they're providing for their families. They, they have very spotty internet connection and, and low uh, familiarity and self-efficacy with computers for those particular kids their learning is, I'm, I'm concerned, is going to drop off. And that has to actually do with our first question that we have from one of our viewers tonight. It's many households can't afford some of the technology or extra bandwidth needed for long term distance learning. What are schools doing to assist students in need? Uh, you know, I, I want to give a cheer to our school districts. They are all hustling and and uh, experimenting with ways of closing the digital divide. Um, I, I can tell you that VIA and SAISD uh, have rigged their buses and, and driven them into neighborhoods where we know there is uh, low participation in broadband subscription. Um, Southwest ISD has turned their public buildings into uh, mega Wi-Fi centers, and so students and families can drive up their cars to connect. SASD has raised money and found money in different uh, uh, accounts uh, and reallocated it to buy technology, laptops, tablets, to distribute it to their students. There's been a lot of hustle to close the digital divide. However, having technology, having access to Wi-Fi is not enough. Uh, there are a whole lot of other family circumstances that impact learning. And, and so uh, I'm afraid we're going to see a, a greater kind of diversity of experiences during this period. All right, next question. With the school year ending early, how are students getting their final grades and how will that affect them moving on to the next grade? Yeah, grading policy is, is district by district and in some cases, uh, school by school. So it's, it's gonna vary. Um, everything is being communicated online uh, um, or through the mail. Uh, so school districts are, are both um, allowing their students to see grades uh, if the assignments are being graded online through secure accounts. And, and of course, uh, report cards are, are also being mailed out. I want to talk about college students now in this next question. Alamo College has just announced a plan to keep students in school and on track by giving out scholarships, which would cover tuition and fees and allow them to use financial aid for living expenses. Do you see other schools implementing similar plans? Uh, I do. I do. I think we're, we're, we're again going to see a lot of experimentation on uh, adjusting, adapting to this new period. And, and really, it represents a, a natural experiment um, where we are seeing interventions to deal with the situation that had never been tried before. You know, take, for example, SAT scores. Uh, schools are, are communicating to students that when they apply, um, they do not have to submit their SAT scores. Not all of them, but a lot of colleges who, who always accepted and, and included SAT scores, ACT scores as part of the admissions process are putting a pause on that. And, and so it, it creates an opportunity for us education researchers to see, huh, does that really make a difference? Are we gonna see a different uh, success rate of students, a different uh, uh, group of students getting into schools and are we going to see different success rates going forward? Maybe we're going to learn that some of the things that we were doing before that we thought were really important because we always have been doing it a certain way aren't as important. Interesting. All right, final question for you. What do you say to parents out there who are concerned about distance learning and how much their kids are getting out of this whole experience? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it is really important to be an advocate for your child and, and to, to, to see and observe how are they spending their time. Um, 
Uh, it, I think this is an opportunity to sort of go back to the basics and encourage students to just read a book. Uh, if they have a musical instrument, just try to, to practice, um, uh, to do things that maybe they didn't have time to, to uh, take on uh, before this event. Now, maybe there's some time to learn how to you know, take out grandma's sewing machine, uh, uh, learn how to, to cook a meal. I would say try to uh, fill your child's uh, time with activities that they are drawn to naturally and encourage that. Look for the opportunities, not the drawbacks. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Urban Education Institute at UTSA Director Dr. Mike Villarreal, thank you for your time tonight, Mike. Thank you, Steve. We'll be right back. Of its nearly 107,000 students, Northside ISD reports the vast majority, 92%, are engaged in distance learning. Still, the city's largest school district says it's doubling down on connecting with the remaining 8% that are not online. It's found some students either lack the technology, don't have enough devices at home, or simply don't have Wi-Fi. It's why the organization Communities in Schools is working with teams at Northside ISD to make home visits, offer food, rental, or utility assistance. What we want to do is really make sure that we're wrapping services around families. And if they've not reached out in some distance learning assignments, then there's clearly some barriers that we've got to try to alleviate for the family. And so families say they appreciate the effort that so many people are putting in to help them out. Here are some of today's top stories. Congress will be back in session on Monday, May 4th. That's according to a tweet from the House Majority Leader's press office. It adds that votes are possible. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell made a similar announcement regarding his chamber earlier in the day. Some House Democrats say they're worried about the spread of COVID-19 at the Capitol, and some say it might send the wrong message if they fly to Washington instead of sheltering in place. Walgreens announcing plans to open drive through COVID-19 testing locations in 49 states and Puerto Rico. With this latest expansion, Walgreens says its focus is to improve access to testing in underserved communities and over time, working with companies to provide testing to employees to help more businesses reopen in the weeks and months ahead. Once all sites are fully operational, Walgreens expects to test more than 50,000 people each week. HEB is extending its hours starting today. All stores will now be open from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. The grocery chain had temporarily limited hours to help keep store shelves stocked. Most pharmacies will open to operate from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and normal weekend hours. You can read more about how HEB and other grocers have responded to the pandemic right now on KSAT.com. What's up guys, time to check out some stories that are trending tonight on KSAT.com. And we're gonna start off with a very interesting story related to the Spurs in some weird roundabout way. Not sure if you've been seeing this documentary on ESPN called The Last Dance. It's basically a documentary about Michael Jordan's last season with the Chicago Bulls. Well, one of the guys on that team was Dennis Rodman. And if you know your Spurs history, then you know that Dennis Rodman played with the Spurs in the mid 90s. So what we did was we researched all the crazy stuff that Dennis Rodman did while he was in San Antonio and put that into an article on our website. It included dating Madonna. Um, he would go on the sideline and take off his shoes and socks. He started to color his hair all sorts of weird ways. He would not show up to practice. He was suspended, fined, all sorts of crazy stuff that, had, that happened with Dennis Rodman while he was in the Alamo City. It's a pretty interesting story. Uh, I definitely think you should uh, check that out. It'll, it's on our website right now on KSAT.com. And uh, it just basically looks back at Dennis Rodman's just wild stint here with the Spurs. When you look at Tim Duncan, hard to believe we had Dennis Rodman here, right? So uh, check that story out. So, all right, switching gears a little bit. Um, South by Southwest, of course, was one of the first things that was canceled earlier uh, due to the coronavirus pandemic. But what film organizers uh, did in order for you to see those movies was they decided to put those movies to stream on Amazon Prime. So right now, 
and through the next 10 days, so through May 6th, you can actually see all the movies that were set to premiere at the South by Southwest Film Festival right now on Amazon Prime. Uh, you can find more information on that on our website, ksat.com. It's a pretty interesting thing that they did. Instead of just completely scrapping all the movies, they decided that, you know what, we're just going to stream everything on Amazon Prime for a few days. So kind of let those film directors, actors, and everyone who worked on those movies get their work out and their projects. A lot of interesting films uh, that over the years that have been screened at South by Southwest has be really become kind of a pretty big festival. So check out that article if you want to see more movies and information on that. All right, speaking of movies, probably the biggest movie news of the day. Yes, The Rise of Skywalker is coming to Disney+. Plus. We now have a date and it of course is May 4th. So for people that are not Star Wars fans, may the 4th be with you. Yes, Yoda? Okay, I don't know. The Jedi? I'm not a huge Star Wars fan. <laughs> I'm just kind of making some stuff up here as I go along. But I have seen this movie. It is pretty good. Um, I think what's interesting about this is that they kind of had to push this up a little bit because obviously the coronavirus pandemic kind of shut down theaters when this was still out, even though it had been out for a little bit. So it'll be kind of cool because now Disney Plus is going to have all nine Star Wars, the uh, Luke Skywalker saga, all those movies are now going to be on Disney Plus starting May the 4th. So pretty interesting stuff there. So if you guys want more information on this, head over to ksat.com. Make sure you guys stay safe out there and I will check in with you guys later. Thank you so much for watching the news at 9. Don't forget, the night beat starts at 10.